<clears throat> Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann and uh, I'm the pastor of the Spring Church and I come out here this Thursday morning with, uh, with a dear brother of mine to preach the gospel of grace to you, to, to exalt the grace of God in salvation. We're here because we care for your souls and where you're going to go when you die. We care for you. We care for whether you're in a right standing before God or you're in a wrong standing before God. It is our desire that you would find hope in Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Other than the name of Jesus Christ. My friends, your trust must be in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. Let's see here. God bless you. Do you need one or two? Oh, one. Okay, okay. God bless you. You have a good morning. Mm. Praise the Lord. No, we... Sounds good. Great, 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 great. Okay, awesome. Praise the Lord. Brother, a Bible. A Bible. You just gave out a Bible. I'm so excited. Oh, man. Praise the Lord. Brother, that girl could be searching. Hey, hey, brother. If you need a Bible, come let me know. Don't worry about interrupting. Okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> Friends, we, we, we care to know that you are in Christ. We, are, we have a great burden for souls because we, we want you to be reconciled to God through the, through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. Friends, we understand that the Word of God clearly says that we have sinned against God, that we have broken God's law, and that we have isolated ourselves from the life of God, that the sinner is under the judgment and wrath of the Father. And the only way that they can be rescued is through the atonement that the Father has provided for Himself. Through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. That is the only way of eternal life for the sinner. And friends, not only do we know that, but we know that Scripture says that there are many who name the name of Jesus Christ, but they do not know Him. They say that they have His salvation, but they truly do not. And so we seek even today to call out false converts, to call out the religious, to call out churchgoers who are still lost and dead in their sins, who need eternal life. Otherwise, they, as, as well as the pagan, will be lost forever in hell. In the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place that is reserved for the enemies of God. And friends, we do not want you to go there. We want you to be pardoned from all your sins, to be cleansed by the blood of Christ, to have all your trust resting fully upon Jesus. For He is jealous for all the glory and salvation. That is why salvation is free. It is all of grace so that God gets all the glory, and so that God gets all the honor and praise. And friends, ultimately, that is what this is this, this morning. This act of, my, of mine and my brothers being out here this morning to share the gospel with you is ultimately an act of worship unto God. For we are grateful to God for the salvation He has given us. We are grateful that He has poured forth His grace upon our souls so that we would enter into glory when we pass from this life. And that is our hope for you, friends. That is our hope for you. And not only that you'd be saved eternally, but you'd be saved even from the power of sin in your life this day. For if you are outside of Christ, you are a slave to sin, and you live in the sewer of iniquity. And friends, it is our desire that you'd be set free from your slavery to sin so that you would live in holiness. And we know the only way that can happen is through the, is through the powerful, life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul himself wrote in Romans 1.16, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Oh friends, and we believe that with all our hearts. We believe that to the, in the depths of our souls that the gospel is the only hope for sinful humanity. It is the only way that a sinner can be reconciled to the Creator God. It is only by believing the gospel of grace 
Can a once dead sinner be raised to spiritual life and understand spiritual things? It is only through the preaching and believing of that Gospel. So friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is out of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 2, and beginning in verse 22, the Apostle Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He writes, You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. And friends, the issue that I would like to address here today that is put forth in these select verses out of Romans 2 is this, is the hypocrisy of the religious. And that religious hypocrites cause pagans, cause the sinner to blaspheme and dishonor God and to trample His name underfoot because they see that the religious hypocrite is only that, simply a hypocrite. Friends, that is what we see around us all, all around this area here in the South. Many people go to church, are involved in church, have had a religious experience once in their lives, but they have never been saved genuinely. They are instead religious but lost. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And friends, such people are in a terrifying position, in a horrible place. Because while they think they have Christ, they truly do not have Him. While they think they know Him, they genuinely do not know Him. And by their actions of hypocrisy, and by their, by their lying and their deceitfulness, they cause people who do not go to church, they cause the non-religious people to blaspheme God's name. They cause the atheist and the pagan to say, why should I believe in the God of Scripture? For His followers do not live as they say they ought to. They do not obey Him as they claim they do. They do not walk in His statutes and walk in His truth as they claim they do on Sundays. So why should I follow after such a God? Oh friends, what are we to say to such people who say things like that? In fact, such people I greatly pity because they have in their lives seen religious hypocrites trample the name of Jesus Christ underfoot. In fact, that is why it is my challenge to you today, my dear friends, to examine yourselves and see whether you are in the faith, to see whether you know Christ, to see whether you live for the glory of Christ, to see whether you obey Him truly. And if you find that you do not live for Christ, though you say you do, I would exhort you to renounce your pseudo-Christianity, to renounce your false Christianity, and to stop trampling the name of Jesus Christ underfoot, to stop being a hypocrite, and therefore causing the pagan, and causing the atheist, and causing the agnostic, evolutionist to trample the name of Jesus Christ underfoot. Friends, it makes it a great difficulty for genuine believers to share the true gospel with the lost when false believers present a Christianity to a lost and dying world that is a powerless Christianity, that is a Christianity filled with a cheap grace. Many people today have a Christianity which is an easy Christianity. They have not denied themselves and taken up their crosses and come after Christ to the place of crucifixion and death. Instead, they live an easy life. They say, well, I'm a Christian because I prayed the prayer or because I walked the aisle or because some evangelist told me I was saved. But they never bear fruit. They care nothing of holiness. They care nothing of walking in accordance to the truth of God's Word. They care nothing about sharing the gospel with the lost or worshiping God in, a, in spirit and truth. And such people are lost and they're self-deceived. And as I said, they cause the enemies of the Lord to further blaspheme Him 
They give the enemies of the Lord greater ground to make accusations against Christ and against the gospel of grace. Because while they claim to have Christ, they do not live as though He gave them a law to obey. In fact, in Matthew 7, the Lord Jesus Himself spoke on this very issue when He said these words in Matthew 7, 22, or excuse me, verse 21. He writes, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of My Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to Me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and in Your name cast out demons? and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Many people who sit in pews in churches around this county and in this nation will hear this pronunciation from the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will be eternally lost in hell, though they themselves were involved in church, though they themselves were perhaps deacons in a Southern Baptist church even or perhaps pastors even. The road to hell is covered with the skulls of pastors and deacons. That may sound astounding to you, but it is true. It is true that many who say they know Christ do not know Him. And that is the very issue that Paul addresses here in these few verses out of Romans 2. And that is the issue that I would like to address this morning with you to be serious and sober with you concerning these issues, not to placate you, not to sugarcoat the truth of Scripture, but out of a care for your soul, out of a genuine care for where you're going to go when you die, I must be truthful with you. Friends, the one who loves you most is the one who tells you the most truth. I would rather wound you with the truth than comfort you with lies. I would rather crush your spirit with the truth of God's Word then lift you up with the lies out of the pit of hell. For those lies will damn your soul. And friends, instead, the truth, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, it will make you free. And so, friends, it is that truth I would like to convey in this sermon this morning. And ultimately, I'd like to consider the Gospel message. The Gospel which truly changes the soul of man. Which truly saves a sinner. Not this false Gospel that is perpetrated here in the South. Not this easy Gospel. But the Gospel which cost the sinner his life. Which cost him his everything. But nonetheless, which saves him from his soul. Jesus Himself said in Mark 9, if, excuse me, in Luke 9, He said, if anyone is to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after Me. Friends, if you think following after Christ is easy, you're deluded. If it has been easy for you, you have not been following after Christ. Friends, but if you can say truly that following after Jesus has been of great difficulty for you, that you have experienced great loss, then I say, take heart, my friend. Take great heart, for you are in His kingdom, because the soul which undergoes great tribulation for the sake of Christ is the soul which has been redeemed by His precious blood. And so therefore, let us consider these truths, and ultimately this Gospel, the Gospel of grace, throughout this sermon this morning. But before we zoom in onto these verses here in Romans 2, I would like to consider the context of the, of the whole of what Paul is writing here in Romans 2, where he has come from and where he is going. In Romans 2, Paul is pointing out the error and the hypocrisy of the religious elite in his day. Now in Paul's day, that was the religious Jews who had rejected Christ, who had rejected the teaching of Christ, rejected the authority of Jesus, and rejected Him wholly as their Messiah. They said, no, He is not our Messiah. We know ultimately from the record of the New Testament that they themselves were the ones who betrayed Him into the hands of the Romans and ultimately were responsible for His crucifixion. And so Paul here very straightforwardly points out the error of the religious and says you are in great need of salvation. That just because you have some religiosity about your life, because you have some outward conformity to rules, does not mean that you have eternal life. Does not mean that you know God. You, just like the pagan, are in great need of salvation. And friends, this has glorious, great application for the biblical South. For the Bible Belt, it is curious to think that here in the Bible Belt, you would think in Lawrence County, 
a place that is littered with churches on every corner, that there would be more holiness, that there would be less drug abuse, that there would be less drunkenness and less divorce rates, that there would be more moral purity among the inhabitants of this land. But what do we find? The exact opposite. And it is because of a false gospel. And it is because of a religious hypocrisy that is preached in pulpits today. And not true holiness that is demanded of from the sinner. And so therefore this text is of great relevance to us. And let's consider the truths that are hidden therein. Before we even zoom in to that, I want to consider all the way going back to verse 17. Because this is all a unit here. These few verses are all a unit here. And Paul writes this in verse 17. Speaking again, as I said, the religious elite of his day. He says, but if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know His will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you rob temples? Or excuse me, do you steal? And that brings us right up to verse 22, which we shall now consider. He writes there, You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And so in the previous verses, he is again questioning, calling into question their moral character, calling them out in their hypocrisy. And he continues that here in verse 22. He even asks him, back in verse 21, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourselves? You therefore who go to church here in Lawrence County, do you not teach yourself the things that you say the lost ought to know? Do you say people ought to love their spouses and ought to live holy, but you yourself do not do such things? Hypocrite, I call you out and call you to believe truly upon Christ. For if you find yourself in such a state, you know not His love. You know not His saving grace. And that moves right into verse... Or excuse me, he continues in verse 21. You who preach that one shall not steal. Do you steal? So he asks them another question. Okay, if you say someone should not steal, do you steal? And that again, as I said a moment ago, has great application for the religious here in this day and age, in this very county, who say they know Christ, but do not live in obedience to Him. What would you think of, of a soldier in the United States military who boasted in his being a soldier and being in service, but he did not obey those who were in authority over him? Such a man would quickly be kicked out of the military and would be let off on a dishonorable discharge. Such a man would not be considered a worthy soldier to serve in the United States military. Yet people think that they are soldiers in the kingdom of God, that they are soldiers for the cross of Christ. Yet they do not obey His charges and do not consider His commands. Such people ought to simply renounce their false Christianity and stop bringing reproach upon the name of Jesus Christ. And then that leads us into verse 22, where Paul then says, You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Sexual immorality. Many people who go and attend church boast in the fact that they hold to a very strong belief concerning sexual purity. And they say the culture ought, be, ought to be sexually pure. But how many of them truly live holy lives before the Lord? How many of them truly live in obedience to the commandments of Christ? Very few. Very few genuinely do. How many people go to church say people ought not commit adultery? People ought not watch pornography. People ought not be lustful in their hearts. But then they go home and they set before their eyes things on television which God hates. Or they go and look on the internet, look upon things on the internet which God detests. They're hypocrites, friends. Hypocrites. Maybe you're one of them. 
then you're a son or daughter of hell, friends. You need Christ. You need salvation from your sins through Jesus Christ. You need to be cleansed from your sins. You need to be cleansed from a guilty conscience. For God has given you an inherent knowledge of right and wrong. You know what is wrong and you know what is right. But you suppress that truth in your unrighteousness and in your sin. He continues, he says, You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Again, just another question to challenge the religious people in his day. The things which you say you believe, do you live in accordance to them? And the answer can well be no. Many people who go to church here do not live in accordance to that which they say they believe. Even I myself have seen this. I've seen this all, I see it all the time as I'm out on the street sharing the gospel. And even being in church for as long as I have and being around church people, I see greater and greater evidence of the truth of Scripture concerning this, that many who say they know Christ do not know Christ. We would do well to have a great persecution come upon the people of Lawrence County. We would do great to have our government suddenly ban all religious worship amongst the Christians. We would do well for our government to do that because it would purge the churches of all the false converts and all the goats among the sheep, the wheat among the tares. It would remove all those who say they know Christ, but they do not truly know Him. And all that would be left is the genuine Christians, the ones who have lost greatly, who have lost a great amount of possessions and things for the glory of Christ, but consider it all as rubbish that they might know Christ better, that they might know Christ deeper, and they might, they might glorify Him in their lives. Verse 23, he continues by saying, You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? I can think back to the eight years of my life where I lived as a false convert. Where I said I was a Christian because I had prayed the prayer and asked Jesus into my heart, right? It didn't matter how I lived, it's just that I did that one-time ritual. And therefore I was okay. Wrong! I was deceived. I thought myself to be converted, but I was desperately lost. Friends! Just because you've had some religious experience or you've done some one-time ritual, that means nothing. The, the question is, are you a new creation? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The question is, have you been born again? It's not, has an evangelist told you you're saved? Or a pastor told you because you did some goofy ritual that you're saved? It is, have I been born from above? Has the Spirit of God raised me to spiritual life? That is the question. And do I live in obedience to Christ? Not so that I might be saved, but because I am saved, out of gratitude toward God for the grace He has bestowed upon me. Friends, I can think back to that period of my life where I was a false convert. And I thought I was saved because I had done that religious ritual. Because I had said I was converted. Because I had said I was saved. But I lived as though Christ never gave me a law to obey. I lived as though Jesus didn't even exist. I lived in rebellion and hypocrisy and in pride. In pornography, addiction to pornography and lust. A great selfishness and disrespect toward my parents, toward my siblings. Friends, I was lost. And if you live in such a manner, I don't care what you say with your lips. It is what you're, how you act. It is how you behave. In fact, there's an old phrase that says, actions speak louder than words. And friends, that is very telling and very true. That your actions speak greatly, much more than your words do. Friends, suppose I was married and I told my wife, that I loved her, but then I went around committing adultery with women all throughout uh, the city of Lawrence or the, the county as a whole. Friends, I would be a liar. I would be lying to my wife. I'd be a deceiver. And yet people say they know Christ. God bless you, ma'am. People say they know Christ, but they live in spiritual adultery. They live in blatant rebellion and blatant immorality. Such people are lost. Such people are not converted. 
Or we consider those who care not to share the gospel with others. People who say they know Christ, but they do not desire to share Christ with others. What do we say concerning them? Well, I will steal from the, uh, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who said, if you desire not that others be saved, then you can know that you yourself are not. Friends, if you say you know the love of Christ, but you do not abide in His love, you do not live in, in the, for the glory of Christ, and you do not live in obedience to Christ, you're lost, you're deceived. Friends, I'm pleading with you. I don't want you to be lost in your sins. I don't want you to die in your sins. Please, flee to Christ for eternal life. Today, you hypocrites, will run to Christ. And friends, I do want to say to those of you who perhaps might accuse me of being harsh or say that, Lucas, the language which you are using is too harsh. Well, friends, I must say that the language which I am employing is biblical language. Listen to what John the Baptist said to the religious people of his day. He says in verse 7 of Matthew 3, he says, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say that God, that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Oh, friends, Christ, Christ is a sufficient Savior. And when He saves a man, the whole of the man is saved. Not just His eternal salvation is secured, but the present salvation from sin is brought about. He is not a slave to sin. He is not a slave to hypocrisy. He is freed. He is a slave to righteousness for the glory of God. Friends, if you're not a slave to righteousness, then you're a slave to sin. And if you're a slave to sin, then you're lost. It's not about what you say with your lips. It's not about how many times you've been to church. It's about have you been born again? Have you been born from above? Has God implanted spiritual life in your soul? Has God raised you from your deadness to sin? and given you eternal life in His Son? That is the question. That is the question that must be answered. And so going back there to Romans chapter 2. God bless you. <laughs> Paul then ends off this section in verse 24 by saying, he quotes the Old Testament here, he says, For the name of God is blessed among the Gentiles because of you just as it is written. And friends, just as that text had great potency in Old Testament days, so it does in the New Covenant and in this new dispensation which we find ourselves in. Friends, the name of God is trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, by the pagans around us in this very county because of the hypocrisy of religious people in this place. Because of those who sit on church pews on Sunday and then are drunk in the bar on Saturday. As I said earlier, I hope God brings a great persecution upon Lawrence County. I hope the government comes and says that you cannot worship as a Christian or else you'll be thrown in prison because that will get rid of all the hypocrites in Lawrence County, in the churches. That will clear us out, friends, and genuine believers will be the only ones who dare meet, who dare worship Christ in such a manner at such a cost. The name of God is blasphemed among the pagans, among the atheists and the agnostics because of the hypocrisy of the religious, of the Methodists, of the Southern Baptists, of those who attend the Church of God churches. Friends, the religious people who are hip hypocrites bring great reproach upon the name of Jesus Christ. And they ought to be called out in their sins. Pastors ought to call them out. And I myself, being a pastor, will say that with boldness, that pastors ought to call false converts out in their sin. Away with this, this unbiblical language of backsliding and, and other false 
narratives and false teachings. Instead, let us stand upon the authority of Holy Scripture. Let everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ depart from evil for the glory of God and for the glory of Jesus Christ, His Son. But we do ask ourselves this question. Who is this God? Who is the God of Scripture? Who is the God of glory? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Who is He? Well, His name is Yahweh. He is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three eternal persons, co-equal, co-existent, yet one essence and nature of God, one being of God. And that nature in no way is it divided. This is the true God, and this God is a holy God. He is set apart from all that is perverse, and all that is evil, and all that is wicked. The God of Scripture is not like us. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In fact, He told Moses, one of the most holy men in his day, that he could not see Him. For no man can see God and live. That is how perfect God is and how holy He is. He is also, as Psalm 119, 137 clearly says, the psalmist writes, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God is a righteous God. He is right in all His ways. He does not sweep sin under the rug, but He is just in all His dealings with the children of men. In fact, Nahum chapter 1 says this, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is His way. And the clouds are the dust beneath His feet. Friends, God is indeed a holy and just and righteous God. And He will not, in His holiness, He will not leave the guilty unpunished. He will not sweep sin under the rug arbitrarily. There must be judgment that comes upon the head of the wicked. Otherwise, God is contradicting His own character. And we know that God will never contradict His character. For His character is perfect. Friends, we, we see an example of the holiness of God in Isaiah 6 when the prophet Isaiah is given the opportunity to stand before God in glory and to see the Lord on His throne. And he says he saw two angels there crying out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Friends, that is telling of the character of God. God is so holy. He is three times, thrice fold holy. And friends, He is not to be messed with. And it is a great evil to offend the holy God of Scripture. It is true that God is gracious and compassionate. We even see it right now playing out in your very life. For God is giving you air to breathe and ground to walk upon, clothes to wear, a car to drive in. Friends, God is indeed gracious and merciful, even toward the wicked. We know from 1 John 4 8, God is love indeed. But those attributes of God never negate His holiness. They never belittle His holiness. They never detract or subtract from His holiness. No, the attributes of God stand in glorious unison with one another. Friends, God is holy. You must understand this. This is hard preaching, yes, but it is true. Don't think so much of yourself to think you can stand before this holy God in your sin. No man, not even the most holy of men, can stand before the Lord in their sin. And God in His perfect holiness has given us His law. He has given us His Ten Commandments. Friends, that, those Ten Commandments are ten eternal statutes of God. They are, they are His, His moral law. And friends, it is a reflection of the character of God. God's law is perfect. It shows us His perfect character. The law of God is not there for just some random purpose. It has a very specific purpose. And as Romans 3 tells us, the law brings about the knowledge of sin. We'll talk about that in a moment. But firstly, the law of God shows us the character of God. You may ask, how is that? Well, when we consider the commands, 
as Jesus summarized them in, in Mark chapter 10. He said to the rich young ruler in Mark 10, 19, he says, do you, um, do, excuse me, he says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Friends, these commands of God show us the character of God. They show us the perfection of His character. That He has not a single spot or blemish upon His character. And He is righteous in all His ways, upright in all His deeds. And He deals with the children of men in justice and in holiness. Consider the one that Jesus says at the beginning, Do not murder. That is because God is not a murderous God. Do not commit adultery. Because God is certainly not an unfaithful God, but a faithful, covenant-keeping God. Do not steal. God gave that command because God certainly is not a thief. He has ownership of all things. And He has the divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with Him. Do not bear false witness, a.k.a. lying. Why does God give that command? Because God is not a liar. And as Hebrews tells us, it is impossible for God to lie. <clears throat> Friends, these commands of God show us the character of God. They show us the perfection of His character. And they show us our sin in light of His character. That's the second function of God's law. For example, we consider the first command, do not murder. Have you ever murdered, my friends? You say, no, certainly I have never murdered. Well, Jesus says in Matthew 5, that if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, that God equates such an evil with murder. God sees you as a murderer. Or the next command, do not commit adultery. Oh, my friends, I ask you this. Have you ever committed adultery? You say, no. Jesus said again, as we go back to Matthew 5, He said, if a man looks at a woman with lust for her, he commits adultery with her in his heart. Friends, God sees the mind. He sees the thoughts. He sees the intent of the heart. And He knows it's perverse. He knows it's evil. Do not begin to say, well, God shall allow me to enter into heaven because I am good. He knows my heart. Friends, truly He does know your heart, but it is evil and it is perverse. It is corrupt to the core. Jeremiah 17, nine says the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick who can understand it my friends the wickedness of man's heart transcends understanding it is great great indeed so I ask you therefore have you committed these sins have you transgressed the law of God in these manners or consider the command you shall not steal or do not steal as Jesus words it here have you ever stolen in your life then God sees you as a thief friends all thieves will have their place in the lake of fire I don't want you to go there I'm warning you I don't want you to go there I don't want you to die in your sins I want you to be saved I want you to be cleansed and the only way that you can be saved from your sin that that guilt that you have before God the only way that it can be removed it's through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Do not bear false witness. Have you lied? Have you lied, friends? Then this guilt is upon you. And all liars, as the book of Revelation tells us, will have their place in the lake of fire. Do not defraud. And lastly, he says, honor your father and mother. Have you broken these commands, friends? Then you have sinned against God. You've sinned against God. This is not just you or just me, but it is the whole of mankind along with us. The whole lot of us has fallen short of the glory of God. We have broken the commands of God. Every last one of us, no one is exempt from sin. No one is exempt from it. It is universal and its reign is upon all people by default. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is an encompassing statement, friends. All people have. 
All people are in desperate need of eternal salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so because the whole of mankind, because all of us have broken the law of God, friends, we must understand this, that all of us have broken the law of God. And in that guilt, we stand before the tribunal of God as transgressors, as lawbreakers, just as a murderer here in Lawrence County, just as a rapist here in Lawrence County must stand before a judge, stand before a tribunal and be punished for his crimes. So too must we as sinners in the hands of an angry God be punished for our sins, be justly punished for our law-breaking before the Creator. It is only just that God would do so. And it is only in accordance with His character. And the punishment that God has for sin, the place of punishment, is hell. It is the place that Jesus described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of outer darkness. The place of torment. The place of an unquenchable flame. And the place where once a soul goes to it, it cannot escape. It is the prison that no one can flee from. That no one can get out of. And God is totally just in doing that. And it is in hell where God unleashes His just wrath upon the wicked. Where God judges sinners because of their law breaking. Just as a rapist or a murderer must be sent to prison for a very long time. And people rejoice to know that when someone here and the United States has broken the law so heinously and so grievously is punished to such an extent. We rejoice because justice has been administered. Friends, it is the same way with the character of God. God is holy and He will see fit that the wicked are punished in hell. And so therefore we are all condemned there. Every last one of us are condemned to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth without hope in and ourselves. Without any hope. That's the bad news. That is the bad news, friends. That we have no hope in and, our, in and of ourselves. That no amount of religious deeds can make us right before our Creator God. Excuse me. Think about a convicted murderer or rapist here in Lawrence County trying to make himself right before the judge. By listing off his accomplishments, it does not work. The same way with God, only God is more perfect. To list off one's accomplishments does not make one right with God. That only offends God more because it is an affront to Him. Because it is an offense to Him. God cannot be bribed. No, God is holy and just. As Genesis tells us, He is the just judge of all the earth. And in His justice... He will see fit that the wicked are punished. And those of you who are religious yet lost, this is something you must get through your head, is your sin and your guilt before God. You must come to grasp how evil you truly are and that you need a Savior and that nothing you do can merit a right standing before God. Nothing you do can make you right before your Creator. And so, friends, we find ourselves in this hopeless state and condemned to hell without any hope. However, friends, the gospel is, the good news of Jesus Christ is that God, in His great love for His elect, in His great love for His church and for His people, He sent forth His Son. See, friends, God in eternity past set aside His elect to save them. He set aside His people to give them eternal life. He set aside a people that He would redeem. The Father predestined His people to life and He covenanted with the Son. He covenanted with the Lord Jesus Christ 
to come that Christ would come and die for this people, this lot of miserable wretches. And Jesus agreed to do it. And the Father's reward for his sufferings would be that he would give him a throne and he would reign over his kingdom forever and ever. And this people whom he would die for would be his bride. And friends, I tell you that Christ, in full submission to the will of the Father, obeyed. He obeyed the will of the Father. He obeyed the charge and the command that the Father gave Him. And He died for the elect of God. He died for the people of God. And my friends, He has received and is continuing to receive and will receive the full reward of His sufferings. The Lamb is worthy to receive the full reward of His sufferings, friends. And it is out of this glorious covenant between the Father and the Son. And even the Holy Spirit agreed to come and to enable Christ to do what He did in His perfect life. And then, then to apply the benefits of redemption to the hearts of the people of God through regeneration. It is out of this covenant of redemption comes the gospel, comes the covenant of grace that God sends His Son into the world. That in the fullness of the times, as Galatians 4, 4 words it, Jesus Christ came and died for sinners. Jesus came. God Almighty became flesh and dwelt among the children of men. As John writes in John 1, he says in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The eternal God, Jesus Christ, came down and became a man. Truly God, yet truly man. And He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the commands of God that we have trampled underfoot. He lived in total submission and in obedience to the law of God. As we've considered earlier those commands that we broke, Christ kept them. That's what He said in Matthew 5, 17. He says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus came and fulfilled the law of the Father. He fulfilled the law of God on behalf of the people of God. My friends, He kept the covenant of works for us. This is the glorious covenant of grace. Trailer, oh, God bless you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, you have a good afternoon. You got a lot of dirt to get out and do this. Praise the Lord. Well, it's only by the grace of God. Every preacher should be out. Amen. Amen. That's right. There's a pastor. Uh, pastors are to do the work of an evangelist. Praise the Lord. Mm. <clears throat> And we know that Jesus fulfilled the law of the Father. We know He kept the law of God perfectly because we see in Matthew 3.17, this happened. At the baptism of Jesus, the Father speaks audibly from heaven and says these words. He says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Friends, no one can have such a, such a de declaration spoken upon them or over them. No one has completely kept the law of God. But Jesus Christ, the righteous, has kept the law of God on behalf of the people of God. And friends, not only has He lived for us, but He has died for us. He has laid down His life as a, as a precious sacrifice. As the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ was beat and whipped and spat upon, made a public mockery, and nailed to the cross of Calvary, where He bore the wrath of the Father against the elect. Against us, my friends, those of you who are in Christ, or shall be in Christ, He bore the wrath of God for the people of God in His death at the cross. The Father counted Jesus as if He broke the law and as if He rebelled, though He was perfect and though He kept the law. The innocent treated as, he, as if He was guilty. The, die, the just died for the unjust. The righteous for the unrighteous. The sinless for the sinner. Friends, this is the beauty of the Gospel that Jesus Christ takes upon Himself the full fury of the wrath of the Father the judgment of God against the sins of the people of God. That is why Isaiah 53 could say in verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. 
Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. What is hell, my friends? It is the God the Father unleashing his wrath upon the wicked. But what is the cross of Jesus Christ? The Father putting His wrath on His Son so that sinners would not have to bear it in hell, so that sinners could be received into celestial glory to dwell with God forever, so that God could bring His church to eternal glory and still be just in doing so and still be righteous in doing so. So God shows both His grace and His holiness, both His love and His justice in the cross of Jesus Christ. That is why in Isaiah 53, 10 it says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him. Friends, He bore the wrath of the Father against sin, against sinners. Every ounce of the wrath of God that I deserve upon myself in hell was put on Christ and He paid for it in full. We know from the book of John that when Jesus died, He said, to Telestai, that is, it is finished. The work of redemption was complete. Christ had procured eternal salvation for the people of God. It is like this, friends. We are guilty lawbreakers and we stand in the courtroom as guilty before God and we deserve punishment for our sin. But Christ comes into that courtroom and pays the bail. He pays the fine for our law breaking. And we can leave the courtroom having been forgiven by the judge. Yet justice has been also brought about. That is why in Romans 3 it says God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Friends, Christ can be just and forgive. I mean, God can be just and forgive you because of the work of Christ. And so he died. And the wrath of God was satisfied. After three days in the tomb, the Father rose Him up from the grave. He rose Him up as a reward for His sufferings. Amongst the many rewards that Christ received, the Father rose Him up to life. As the public display that He had received, His sacrifice is sufficient payment for our sins. As Romans 4.25 says, that Christ was raised because of our justification. In other words, to bring about our salvation. Jesus Christ is alive today, never to die again. He is the true God and eternal life, the living God, and death will never have power over Him. Even in that period of time where He allowed death to overtake Him, even that was Him willingly doing that, for He has infinite power. He is omnipotent. And my friends, He is alive today forevermore and will never die again. After 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, among His beloved disciples, He then went to the top of the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem and bodily ascended into heaven. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He sat down at the right hand of the Father in glory and He has completed the work of redemption once for all. It is done. The work of salvation is complete. And He now lives to make intercession for the people of God. It is finished, friends. He reigns as King over the universe and the call of the Gospel, the call of the Gospel of Jesus Christ as Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, He said, repent and believe in the Gospel. The call of the Gospel is that you must repent. The sinner must repent and believe. Repentance means to change one's mind, to be grieved over your sin, to be broken and to see that you cannot save yourself, that your deeds of righteousness cannot merit a right standing before God, that you're a sinner and you deserve God's punishment for your sin. Repentance is a resolve to flee sin, to turn from it and to flee to Christ. 
You must turn from your sin. And the second thing you must believe, you must believe upon Christ alone. You must believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. The sinner must grab hold of the promises of God as they're revealed in Scripture and believe that what God said concerning Christ is true. That He truly is Lord. That He truly is King. And that He has truly done the work of salvation on behalf of His people. And the sinner who repents and believes, God will forgive them of all their sins. God will forgive them of all their sins, past, present, and future. They will be cleansed by the finished work of Christ. Cleansed by what Jesus has done. Forgiven justly because of Christ's atoning work at the cross. And the Father will credit them with having lived Jesus' life. The Father will wrap them in the righteousness of Christ. They will be treated as if they lived Jesus' life because Jesus was treated as if He lived theirs. That's the great exchange of the Gospel, friends. Christ takes my sin, I get His righteousness. Christ takes my filth, and I receive His perfect robe of righteousness. I receive His garment of righteousness as a gift from the Father, as a gift of grace. The Father counts, counts me as if I lived Jesus' life because He counted Christ as if He lived my life. That is glorious, friends. That's the grace of God. My friends, flee to Christ. Believe upon Christ for eternal life. The sinner who believes, who repents, who believes upon Christ, this is what they receive from God as a gift of grace. This is what they receive from God all out of the unmerited favor of God, the unmerited mercy of God. Friends, cast yourself upon the mercy of God as it is revealed in Christ. The Gospel is not that God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. The Gospel is that Jesus Christ saves sinners from their sin. That is the Gospel. Jesus saves sinners. And as was aforementioned earlier, Friends, the genuine convert, the genuine believer in Christ, the one who has been truly saved, will live in obedience to Christ. Their thoughts, their actions, their deeds, the intent of their heart, it will all be changed. When I was genuinely converted, I became a new creation. I was changed from the inside out. God did a miracle work in my heart, friends. And let me tell you, if you are genuinely converted this day, you will be changed. You'll be a new creation. And if not, it's because what you got today was false and it was not real. Many people claim to have Christ, but they don't have Him because they they don't live for Him. It is not that we are justified by our works, no, my friends, but we work, we bear fruit because we have been saved by the grace of God. And the reason the genuine Christian bears such fruit is because they are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. New things have come. Jesus does not only save from hell, my friends. Jesus saves from the power of sin in your life. He saves you from your drunkenness, your drug abuse, your pornography, your, your selfishness, your pride. Your idolatry. He saves sinners from that. That is why John could write in 1 John 2, 4, or excuse me, in 1 John 2, 3, he says, By this we know that we have come to know Him. If we keep His commandments, the one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. Whoever keeps His Word in Him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk in the same manner as He walked. And not only is this a life-changing gospel, but this gospel of Jesus Christ is for the Christian. My dear brethren who are out here today, fellow Christians, I cry out to you to rest upon the gospel of grace today, to remind yourself of what Jesus has done for you, what He's done for us, that He died for our sins and was raised on the third day, and that we've received salvation because of it. Fellow Christians, 
rest once more in the gospel today and preach the gospel. Share the gospel with the lost and dying world, friends, for the rest of your lives. It is all by grace, all out of the free grace of God. It is by grace we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. All because God is so gracious. And it is all for the glory of God. It is all to the glory and praise and honor and exaltation of God. God has done all this. God has created this world. God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. God has saved me and all the elect who have been saved up to this point. And whoever will be saved, He has done it all and will do it all for His glory. God is for His own glory. God is out to bring His name, glory and praise and honor. It is all for the glory of God. So to God be the glory. Listen to what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.17. He said, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of undisciplined men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. To Jesus Christ be glory forever indeed. Amen. Amen. Oh friends, lost sinners, come to Jesus Christ and be saved from hell. Be saved from the wrath of the Father. Be saved from the power of sin in your own heart and your own life. And you who are religious yet lost, I encourage you to come to Christ. You who say you know Christ, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. And flee to Christ if you see that you do not bear fruit. If you see that you truly do not know Him. Flee to Christ for eternal life. And my dear Christian friends, my brethren, my fellow citizens in the kingdom of God, as I said earlier, rest in the gospel today and preach it. Preach it for the rest of your lives to the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, that religious hypocrites, those who say they have God, say they have eternal life in Christ, but truly do not, bring great reproach upon the name of Jesus Christ. Bring great reproach upon His name. They cause the pagans to blaspheme the name of Christ. And such people are lost. They are hypocrites and they need eternal life in Jesus Christ desperately. In spite of whatever they say, they need Christ truly. They need to believe on Him unto salvation. And we have seen that not only are they sinners, not only are the religious hypocrites sinners, but all of us are sinners. And we deserve hell for our sin. Yet God sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Jesus died and rose again and intercedes on behalf of sinners right now in heaven. Friends, and all who come to Him will be saved from their sins. This is all by the grace of God and all for the glory of God. So to the triune God, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one true God who is working all things to redound to His glory, to bring His name glory, to the God who has made all things, who has caused all the Scriptures to be written, who has caused me to be born again and who has enabled me to come out here today, who has not even enabled you in His sovereignty to hear the preaching of the Gospel of His Son. To this God, to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, be all glory and praise and honor forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen. Amen. Hmm.